cool. So we'll just go ahead and get started. Welcome, everybody. All right, welcome, everybody, to the panel called The Other Voice. I thought about this panel because I myself am a content creator. Um, a little bit about myself. I have a company called ABF Creative, and we are an audio first media company. And so we produce branded podcasts. We have a podcast with BET, we have a podcast with Prudential coming out, and several others. And so I, I wanted to also explore creating content for the voice space. And so instead of being stingy and trying to call these guys up individually and keep all the knowledge to myself, I figured why not you know, have a panel where everybody could benefit. And so that's the reason why this panel was born. Uh, but by, by the raising hand, I want to get a gauge of the room. How many people are content creators in the room? Like, how many people are podcasters? Just a few? OK. How many people have media companies? All right. So it's a good, good number of people who will benefit uh, from what we're going to learn today. Um, but we'll start off with some introductions. Um, if you don't mind, Eric, I want to start from left to right. We'll kind of introduce ourselves and tell a little bit about who you are and who you work for and what you do. And then also, what made you fall in love with audio? Um, hi, everyone. My name is Eric Bornstein. I oversee strategy and business development for New York Times Audio. Um, the Times is historically a news publisher. And about two years ago, we, we became a podcast pub publisher as well. Uh, we produce a few different podcasts, Still Processing, Dear Sugars, uh, Book Review, Podcast, and a daily news show called The Daily. Um, I'm generally working, for the most part, on, on our long-term strategy, how do we grow the business, uh, partnerships, uh, and monetization. Oh, how did I fall in love with audio? Um, <laughs> it was probably This American Life um, on the radio growing up on, on NPR, and then when that became a podcast, that was an easy move for me. Hi, I'm Kate Seabury. I am a director of original content development at Audible. And I've been at Audible for about three years and right now focusing on nonfiction content and developing in that space. Um, I fell in love with audio, and I always tell this story because I've kind of been working in audio for a very long time now, but. My mom had me drive my little brother to his friend's house, and I had to wait for him to drop something off and come back inside. And I just got my license, and I was flipping through the radio. And I already knew I was interested in journalism, but I had come across someone talking and telling a story about the Iraq war. And I was captivated. Um, I thought I always wanted to be someone who did print journalism. But after hearing that and, and feeling so much from listening to that story being told rather than reading it, it changed my whole perspective about what I wanted to do with my career and what kinds of stories I wanted to tell. And that audio for me was a really powerful medium to share information in. Hi, I'm uh, Wilson Standish. I'm the director of voice at Gimlet Media. Uh, Gimlet is a podcast company. We make you know, shows like Reply All and Startup and The Nod. Um, we also make fiction shows now, like Homecoming, which will be a, um, uh, a TV show on Amazon coming out this fall. Um, and, and we created a skill called Chompers. And so I came on about five months ago to help run this group and think about what can we do with voice for, for our editorial shows and working with brands and thinking about how can we continue to experiment and push the boundaries of this space with such a new kind of bubbling up um, medium that's already at mass scale. I guess I would say I fell in love with, with audio um, uh, growing up listening to like college radio. Uh, I grew up in Chicago and Northwestern had an amazing college radio and then I ran the, my college's radio station and just, it just had the best time. And so I've been a big podcast listener since it started and, and, uh, and it's, it's a really fun space to be in now. Perfect, perfect. And I forgot to ask this question at the top, but how many people are aspiring podcasters? Butter is the hands. OK, all right. So you know, when we think about uh, the voice conference, you know, when I first heard of Alexa, you know, I was kind of blown away. And I personally didn't know how I would use it in my everyday life. 
Uh, but then I, you know, fell in love with it. I bought one, a uh, Echo Dot, and now I listen to the daily every day. Um, I listen to music stations. I even have it checking the weather. I don't leave the house without saying, Alexa, what's the weather? So I definitely want to know, like, how did you guys, you know, do you own a smart speaker? And if so, like, what are your favorite skills and what do you kind of see uh, as something that you could personally use it for? Anybody can start. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have. Um, I have. I have all the devices, but I, my primary is definitely uh, Google Home, and I'm using it for the utility stuff right now a lot. And then I'm really interested in kind of exploring like the interactive uh, entertainment, interactive audio. I think that's a bubbling up space that we're just starting to scratch the surface. And so um, I, I think it look. I'm really interested in when skills can kind of blend utility and entertainment, and those are the ones that, have, uh, that I've been using the most. For me, I use an Alexa, and I also have been a big fan of Sonos speakers for a really long time, and now my Alexa can control my Sonos, which is fantastic. Um, I use Alexa primarily for, for listening, listening to audiobooks, for the weather, and for also utility. Um, kitchen timer and Philips Hue light bulbs, so it can control my lights, so I don't have to get out of bed when I'm done reading to shut something off. Um, but the Sonos uh, pre-Alexa has been like a really important thing and a huge part of my listening behavior at home. Um, I have an Echo and a Google Home. Um, for a long time, I was primarily Echo, and I've recently made the switch to Google Home I, because I love this one thing it does where I can, I also have a Google Chromecast and I use my voice to interact with my television now. Um, I think utility, I would agree with everyone that utility is my prim primary use case on smart speakers. Um, and when I'm listening to media, whether that's podcasts or music, I'm, I'm typically using my phone and, and then connecting Bluetooth to my smart, smart speaker. So just to stay on you, you know, like what, you know, you, what effect has, you know, voice you think had, is, had in your industry? You deal with strategy, you deal with, you know, pretty much uh, looking, being able to look into the future and then structure how New York Times goes into these new industries. And so you being head of audio, like, what do you think has been the effect so far? Sure. I mean, I think for the, the times, at the times we think about it in two ways. One, as a podcast publisher, um, we think this is a new surface where people are spending more time and are interested in news um, and listening to audio. So um, if, if if everyone already has their smartphone with them constantly, they now have a smart speaker in their home. Eventually, it will be in their car. It's just another surface where more people are listening to more audio. And I think all ships rise with that tide. We also think about smart speakers and voice as a news publisher. Um, and I think from that perspective, we are still thinking audio first, but we are thinking about maybe different formats. Um, I think it's a little bit unclear at the moment what the prevailing formats that are native to voice platforms uh, and what, the, what they will be. Um, and so we're sort of looking at the market to see what, um, what, what formats resonate, what cadence resonates. Uh, I mean, the Daily is a product that's built native for smartphones, um, and it's done well on smart speakers, but we also want to think native to the platform um, and, and, try, and try to come up with what's going to work best there. Same question for Kate. Um, I think, you know, the Echo is such a natural platform for Audible, and Audible is part of the Amazon family, and we've always been obsessed or about listening to stories, and this is such a seamless way to do that and makes so much sense for people who are already using our service. So it's a really, really um, something we spend a lot of time thinking about, and I know our development team spends a lot of time working on making that process as easy as possible. Uh, I think also, uh, as Eric said, thinking about um, what kinds of ways can we begin to think about content that makes a lot of sense for what listening behaviors look like on those devices uh, based off of time of day, based off of how many hours they want to listen. So that's something that I also uh, spend a lot of time thinking about. Can you repeat repeat the question. I was like lost listening yeah, to like, so what, what effect do you think it's had on your company? You know, I know that Gimlet is now jumping in. Yeah. You, know, you mentioned Chompers. So like what, what do you see as the, the big effect it had on Gimlet? Yeah, I think, you know, I think 
Gimlet wanted to jump into voice for um, for a couple of reasons. I mean, one, we see, as, as these guys talked about, like voice is going to be a major way that people access podcasts. So um, we want to be there. We want to know um, how people are using it and, and get the data and understand, like, when are you using it? Why are you using it? Especially as we see this interface continue to grow. And then I think it, it gives us this opportunity to think about new audio formats that we just that don't even exist today. Like, Chompers is the skill we built. It's a two-minute, um, you know, entertainment uh, co audio content for kids to listen to while they brush their teeth. I mean, it's a glorified timer, essentially. But the kids are learning. The content is serialized to help them, you know, look forward to the next time that they get to uh, get to brush their teeth rather than have to. And it's been this amazing effect. And so that kind of opened our eyes in terms of like, OK, well, what other audio aren't we even thinking about right now? And what can be out there? And that's where we, we for our company's trajectory, we're just excited to kind of unleash the creators that we have in our building on the platform and be like, well, what else can we create? What utilities can we fill with content? What types of um, interactive content just doesn't even exist yet? And how can we um, experiment that to, to help kind of forge that path? Yeah, and just, just to you know, piggyback off that, definitely another question is like, we see a lot of companies like Gimlet, um, Audible, obviously super huge, part of Amazon. You have the New York Times, arguably the most popular newspaper in the world, you know, adapting and jumping into voice um, and seeing it as a, a true technology that they want to take on. Why do you think it's so easy for larger brands to jump on to voice, you know, versus, you know, there was some hype about 3D not too long ago. I don't, remember, I don't know if you guys remember that. And then VR technology kind of had a run. In a, in, a, in a way, but the, it hasn't been um, caught on with a lot of large brands. Like, why do you think voice is something like a lot of brands and media properties like yourself want to jump on it? I'll, I'll take a, like a, qu a quick uh, answer to that. I mean, I think that companies like ours do well in voice uh, because discovery is, is still is, is, is an unsolved challenge on voice devices. And in the absence of an easy way to figure out what's great and um, I think people go, go to brands that they know. And so people know they love Gimlet podcasts, they know they love Audible Originals, they know they like the New York Times, and so they, they jump to known quantities because there's no easy way for them to find unknown independents right now who, um, in, in an environment without a screen, um, to help them discover. I think for, for both of us, our primary format is telling stories and audio. So. It, it makes a ton of sense for our companies and what we do. And I think that another interesting part about voice in general uh, is that there's a, always been kind of a lower barrier to entry into getting into audio. Uh, I, equipment for VR is and 3D is so expensive. The cost to get involved to start making content in that space is huge. <laughs> and then when you look at it from the consumer perspective, to buy a pair of Oculus, uh, that's another investment that a lot of people don't have uh, the ability to kind of invest in, if, even if they are interested. But um, audio is good for, for media companies because it is a bit of a lower barrier to entry on the cost side, and good for consumers too because they're also not having to make a huge investment upfront where in a space where there's still not even really that much content. I, I would I would agree with all that. I think. Um, that is you know, why media brands are jumping into this. And I think we're seeing a lot of brands outside of just media and publishing jump into it because you know, voice is going to rock a lot of CPG world um, when it comes to product discovery. And so they're, they're very nervous about it in a way that 3D and AR wasn't going to disrupt the shopping um, behavior. And I think that's one of the reasons why so many companies um, that, you know, whether it be Pepsi or P&G, they know voice is going to be critical to the business when 2020 hits and more than half of searches are done by your voice. And then all of a sudden, what does product discovery look like? What does a brand loyalty look like? What does, um, you know, uh, acquiring new uh, consumers look like in this voice space? And I think that's why they're, they're feeling like we need to jump in and learn because this rate of growth is like nothing we've seen and we do not want to be left behind. Yeah. So I would say search is also a big reason why so many brands are jumping in. I, I completely agree too. If you start to think about 
voice and the ability that these devices have as kind of your new web browser, it changes the way that everyone needs to be thinking about how they're investing in what they do on these platforms. Definitely, and just to add to that, you know, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine and I was talking about how when uh, Prime Day, um, the Echo Dot was only $30. And, you know, and then I was thinking to myself, like, well, if it's $30 now, a year from now, it'll probably be only $20 or maybe even less, maybe $15 for Echo Dot. I think the opportunity is huge, especially in, uh, you know, inner cities like Newark and other cities, uh, inner cities across America for young people to be able to not only get on these devices to start creating content, but also just educational purposes in general. Um, I think that could be huge, and that kind of bounces to my next question for Wilson is like, why children? You know, and, and do you think like that's the biggest opportunity for voice? Do you think the, the, the children, creating content for children is the biggest opportunity, or you think there's other opportunities? I think, I think it's one of the large ones. I think that we're in this like weird time where um, like publishing companies like us are, are, are trying to test things out and be like, is this the type of engagement that you want? And then we have to kind of react to what people are, are the feedback that they're giving because neither party really knows what the best experience is yet. And so we have to figure that out. Whereas kids are just so open to it. And um, with most new mediums, it first starts off with with games and with playing and, 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 and kind of exploration and, and discovery. And I think kids are just like, I think the platform does a couple amazing things for kids where they feel in control. They can ask this device, this all-knowing device questions and get instant feedback, which is something as a kid just don't typically have. With Chompers, what was so important for us is that it was no longer, you know, like everyone said to us, oh, kids won't engage with this. Um, kids have to have a screen if they want to be entertained. It's not going to work. Um, but what we found was what voice allows is the kid can summon the content in a way that they can't with needing to ask their parents for their phone for YouTube or, or take over the family um, TV. And so there's this sense of power that kids have with voice that's incredibly powerful. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that we, uh, we, we focused on it. And, and we wanted to prove people wrong that, that audio content for kids is a really viable um, opportunity. It's just it's been underserved. I mean, audio comes from radio, and traditionally there weren't a lot of kids' radio shows. But mm. now we wanted to fill that white space and, and develop something and, and prove that there's a bigger opportunity in the marketplace. Yeah. For the record, I did listen to Radio Disney as a kid. You know, so but there's like, that's it. You know, so you I'm just, know, I'm just throwing that out there. You know, yeah, yeah. I was a, you know, it was AM radio, but you know, it was, it was still, it was, it was hot. It was yeah. hot. All right, uh, you know, uh, so with, for Kate, you know, you guys, first of all, Kate actually told me that she just got a fellowship. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that, you know, and what role that's going to play with your, at uh, Audible? Sure, so it's actually not something that is related to Audible at all. It's a personal side project, but I'm a, a Knight Innovation News Fellow at the Tao Center uh, at Columbia's Graduate School of Journalism and working separately um, outside of my day-to-day -day in a different space, which is thinking about news and smart speakers and um, kind of doing a lot of qualitative research around uh, when you're listening to the news or asking for news from one of these devices, or where is it falling short and how does that impact things like partisanship and trust um, and your news IQ. So very separate from what I do <laughs> in my day-to-day -day where I'm super focused on narrative storytelling uh, in audio, but also an exciting, nice thing to do outside of my job at Audible. And congratulations on that. Um, but, oh yeah. That's, <laughs> uh, but in her day job, she's, she's the head of scripted content at Audible, and scripted content is, you know, I've always fell in love with scripted content because it's almost like listening to like a movie or a television show on your ears. So you get real voice actors, you get real scenes. You, if it's raining, you hear the rain. You know, if there's an argument in the car, it sounds like an argument in the car. Uh, that, that was always enticing, so I would love, oh, you wanna? So I don't, I, don't, I do work somewhat in scripted, but okay. mostly my, my main focus has been on uh, nonfiction content. Um, and the exciting thing there is that, like I mentioned, 
we are super obsessed with narrative storytelling and things that have an arc uh, and really getting to explore that in the audio space where what you've kind of been used to a lot of people producing in the audio space are things that are episodic but might not always have a through line all the way to the end. Um, but thinking about building audio content that in some ways kind of mimics TV. Like when you think about a Silicon Valley, uh, though there are episodes of, of those things, there's a storyline throughout the whole thing that you follow through and it allows for bingeability. So thinking about some of those components in the way that we develop some of the content that we're making on our team is super exciting and um, really fun and... Yeah. I mean, is there, is there uh, any goals on making like interactive stories and is that something that you know you look forward to doing like basically taking a lot of the narrative the storytelling and bringing the listener into the experience itself yeah i'm sure that we'll think about that uh in what we do um we're always trying to be innovative and always trying new things which is fantastic and i think uh, those kinds of things are things that we think about um but really just my primary day-to-day -day focus is on finding these amazing uh, narrative nonfiction stories that take you on a journey and help you build a connection with a person. Definitely, and then uh, for Wilson, I know you guys create a lot of scripted content, narrative, storytelling as well. Is there any goals on or anything coming that kind of marries those both worlds between you know, interactive, yeah. Interactive yeah, storytelling. De definitely. We um, so we have put out uh, two, no, yes, two uh, fiction uh, podcasts already, and we have a third coming out this fall. And what we're really excited about is there will also be a companion skill that's going to come out with the fiction, and so it gives the the listener the chance to explore the world, um, looking for this certain character. And then if they find the character, they can actually ask her questions and engage with her. And so the more the person has listened to the podcast, the more um, they'll be able to navigate the skill successfully. And there will be a bunch of Easter eggs hidden in there. So if you ask the character the right questions, you might learn things about the world of the show, and you might even uh, find out some hints for the second season of that show. Um, so we really want to think about it. And it'll be the first time that a podcast comes out with this interactive um, audio companion. We've done this with books in the past with our homecoming show, but we really wanted to figure out how can we marry these worlds of, of interactive uh, storytelling and entertainment. And, and so the same team that's developing the podcast is actually scripting, recording, directing our skill. And so we want them to be as seamless of worlds as possible, and that, that will come out in uh, mid-October. Nice, nice. Is that the first time you mentioned that? Um, it is, yeah, yeah. I think okay. this is for the first time. Just give it a hand, a round of applause for some news being broken here. <laughs> yeah, we're Only excited. Here. Only here. So, uh, Eric, you know, in news, uh, you know, like I said, I listen to the Daily every day. Um, Alexa, what's in the news, by the way? And uh, what what else are you guys looking to do with the voice space when it comes to news? You know. Kate just mentioned, you know, she's doing a lot of studies behind that, a lot of uh, research behind that. What do you think is the opportunity for news when it comes to this space? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a huge opportunity for news um, within voice. We already know that news is a top use case on smart speakers. Um, for the most part, they're asking Alexa or Google Assistant for the news. Mm -hmm. um, so that is one news experience that exists on these devices. Uh, news also comes up a lot if users are just asking general questions. What's happening with ISIS? What's happening with Russia? I mean, that is a news experience. Mm -hmm. And then there are news experiences where someone is asking for the New York Times or the Daily. I think the, the biggest questions for us are how we participate in each of those three experiences. Yeah. Search, aggregated news, and then someone who asks for the New York Times directly. Yeah, perfect. So I want to kind of switch gears a little bit and ask some questions around content creation, you know, and what do you think is the best way for someone to get started, you know, using voice or just content in general? How do they go about thinking about starting? One, one thing I always tell people that ask me, like, how do I, how do I, you know, tell a story in audio? 
I always say, well, tell me why you want to tell this story in audio, and why is audio the best medium for you telling this story? And I think thinking about what makes it specifically relevant to tell it in sound is always something really important and something to keep in mind. And how does telling it in sound enhance the experience uh, of somebody who's going to be listening to it? Like, what can you do that makes it much more unique by using sound to, to tell this story? So that's, that's something I always give as kind of my first piece of advice to anybody who is wanting to start uh, producing something in audio. Yeah, I, I would also say um, I think that I think there's like a couple things to always think about where it's what is the purpose of this thing existing in the world? Like why is it there? How, how, do you, how does it have a role? Because if it's just mindless entertainment, it, it, people are going to pass it by. But if, there's, if this piece of content or this story has a role in the world and is, is doing a function, people will really um, be so much happier to engage with it if that's the case. And so asking yourself, why does this exist and what, what gap am I filling or what role is something I think to start with. And then I think when it comes to voice, you know, we were talking about, you know, uh, Eric was talking about how, you know, he's done a couple um, MVP skill, and, um, you know, just messing around. I think we're at this time right now where we're, there's no experts. You know, the experts are being developed now. So just, mm -hmm. you know, messing around, watching YouTube videos, testing things, trying to launch things even just on your own, um, you know, in your own console that you don't have to publish it is the best way to get started, especially when it comes to skills. And, and just asking yourself, what's the skill I wish existed in the world? Um, like, I have a buddy, he just made this skill just for the fun of it, and it was just a tool so that he didn't have to tell guests in his Airbnb what the Wi-Fi password was. So you ask Alexa, what's the Wi-Fi password? You give it your cell phone number, and the password is texted to your phone. And it was just because he wanted that. He was annoyed with having to like tell all his guests the Wi-Fi password. But, uh, but then he put this thing out there, and so many people liked it. All of a sudden, he had this listserv of about 45,000 um, cell phone numbers because people kept using this. And he was like, what do I do with this list? And he didn't even know. So I think it's just, what's the, the thing you want to solve? And just experimenting, because it's such an early phase. We need more people experimenting in the space. Definitely. Eric, would you like to touch on that? Perfect, perfect. I have a question um, that's more like, to me, like, you guys all deal at the high level when it comes to producing this kind of content. I think it'd be great to know, like, how do you know an idea is a good one? You know, I think that's, you know, something I struggle with. I'm pretty sure other content creators struggle with. But, you know, I want to know, how does Gimlet know? How does New York Times know? How does Audible know what a good idea is? Anybody can start. <laughs> I think it's something that we struggle with. It's hard, right? It's not easy. We're trying to figure out how can we prototype things quicker and, and test things, and that's something we're actively thinking about. But I think, you know, sometimes it's, it's just following your gut and, and trusting yourself and, and, uh, and then also showing it to people or talking to people that don't like the medium or don't engage with the medium. That's like one of my favorite tests is like when we have an idea uh, and we're, we're scripting and, and we're, we're testing out and we have some mocks of what the skill might sound like, giving it to someone that doesn't have this device and do they like it and see how they react. From a production and editorial perspective, which I don't spend a lot of my time with, I mean, I think there's a lot of piloting, um, you know, a lot of people chiming in to see if something really resonates as a good idea. From, from the business perspective, I mean, I think it's, it's all about, it's all about experiments that prove out hypotheses. Um, you know, when, when we were, before we were in the podcasting space, we, we had a hypothesis that the New York Times would resonate in this medium, and we proved it out through a partnership around the Modern Love podcast, where, you know, it, it was a simple and easy way for us to test the waters and see if there was an audience. In that case, the, that podcast was successful, and it gave us the confidence that we needed to feel like podcasting was a good idea for the Times. For us, it's a lot of paying attention to our customers and what we know that they're already consuming and what they like, and really keeping them top of mind when it comes to things that we think about wanting to invest in making next. And then also, it's, it's a lot of gut check, too. I think that's for any content maker. You can't always rely on, uh, on data solely. It's a lot of, uh, after listening to someone who brings you an idea, and kind of uh, mapping it out with them. It's really like gut checking it with yourself and, and with other people 
uh, who would be your audience and, and kind of understanding what's resonating and what's not resonating and tweaking from there. Perfect. So I have one last question and we're gonna open it up for questions from the audience. We have someone who will bring the mic to you. Uh, but my question is like for a long time, um, audio has kind of been the little step cousin to video, right? Like anytime, you know, I remember being on the phone with someone saying, hey, I'm, I wanna do branded podcasts. Like podcasts, you're in the wrong business. <laughs> you know, I'm like, dang, like, all right, well, more money for me. But either way, you know, I was thinking to myself, like this opportunity here, like I don't know why a lot of people never really saw it or didn't catch on, but now it seems like there's a, a shift that's happening you know, what do you think is driving that change? Well, just what everyone's here for, the, the fact that there's a platform that's in so many people's homes that's made for listening is a really kind of good indicator that it's something that's worth investing in now more than ever. I think before, um, video was something a lot of media companies were investing in rather than audio, primarily because there were good CPMs uh, and they could make money around it easier. But I think when you look at how people engage with listening and what it makes them feel, you begin to understand that it's really fantastic for your brand uh, and, and that people are really committed to spending a lot of time consuming by listening. I think most emerging forms of media have a chicken and egg problem, which is uh, you want to see audiences there before you put a bunch of resources into producing content. You're not going to produce really expensive content until an audience is there. Um, and I think what happened in audio was, you know, we had the serial moment. We you know we had startup. We started having hits, uh, and there, there really started to be much more buzz around the medium. And I think the, the rest really followed because the audiences were proven to be there. And I, and I think the one thing I totally agree, and I think the one thing I'll add to that is just that, you know, I think it's easy to forget that. You know, while this technology feels so new and it feels like people are changing, really, I mean, the human brain is very slow to evolve um, and, you know, on a neurological level. And, and audio storytelling is still one of the things that we're built for. And it's this moment where, where all of a sudden the listener becomes the creator, right? I get to decide what the characters look like, what the room looks like, what, what every, and, and, and that level of engagement, what we found, in, and it was backed up by an Edison study that, you know, 64% of people took, ad, uh, uh, took an action on an ad that they heard in audio, whereas for, for YouTube, it was only 34%. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, going back to this storytelling that humans are built for is actually resonating on a deeper level, even though, you know, um, TV can be extremely glamorous, um, it doesn't kind of hit you in your core, like you were saying, you know, you are inside this person's mind and creating such a deep relationship. And I think that uh, that relationship people are starting to figure out and as the data continues to follow, we'll see more and more brands entering the space. But the, the data that exists right now in podcasting is extremely limited. Just one note on that, which always kind of stands out to me and, and really resonates with me as to why audio. Um, someone once told me to listen is to feel mm -hmm. and that is an argument enough as to why this kind of stuff is really captivating and compelling with people. And I think we're finally seeing the types of budgets and seriousness um, put to the medium and, and people are getting like Hollywood quality audio experiences and it's pushing them to, and I think you're right, it was all like serial was such a big game change for the entire industry and we keep seeing these milestones and it's now people are expecting premium audio and see what the medium can live up to. Perfect, perfect. Let's give, let's give them a round of applause real quick. Thank you. We're going to take a, a Q&A for about 10 minutes. Um, we have a first question back there. All right. So what uh, advice do you have for podcasters who are debating whether to use their own spoken voice or to maybe use like a, a branded AI generated voice to voice their content? I mean, I, I can speak for Gimlet. At Gimlet, we've taken the stance of we prefer scripted voiced actors. We, we are, I mean, we're, our engineers are so obsessed with controlling sound, so the idea of like handing over an audio experience to an unpredictable um, AI, it, like they make some cringe. So it's, 
way more expensive to script, record, um, you know, sound design. Uh, and so it's, you know, if you have those resources and have the time to do it, we recommend it. But um, it, there's, there's such a trade off, but what we're trying to do is in, in as much as possible is record actors um, rather than uh, leaning towards the, the AI voices. Also the same us that Powerful, always kind of understood the power of human Hi, um, for the media companies. So besides ads that are already packaged into your podcast program that you might, you know, it's a part of the program and that's what someone's gonna hear when they pull it up uh, via voice, uh, what's your thoughts around ads and selling ad space within the voice experience content? Is it any different or is it just the same as usual? on all of these, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, for us, it's, um, I mean, Gimlet was a big pioneer in uh, what ads sound like for podcasts in general and making sure that they felt native and they were their own story and we're taking that same approach. We wanna figure out, you know, how can the consumer benefit from the brand being in the space and so that they don't have this relationship with this brand is being disruptive to my experience, but I'm glad they're here because they're telling me information I want or they're telling me a story. So. Uh, the short answer being, I think it has to be totally rethought of and trying to just take what worked on radio or even what worked on podcast, you, we have to rethink. Um, is voice an input or, or a channel, and how will multimodal devices ch change as five years from now? Uh, you're, you know, you mentioned you know you love talking to your Chromecast. Uh, how will that change as TVs are voice enabled and um, th there's more video on the platform? Okay. Um, I. I a lot of the signs point to that voice will continue to be the interface, but um, that there will be a visual output. And so we're also thinking about that. So like our, our um, we're thinking about how can we add visuals to chompers and, and all those kinds of things. And, and uh, our, our fiction show will have visual components. And, and that's basically the writings on the wall that voice is the interface, um, but it's not the end of the experience forever. There will be a lot of audio experiences for like the car, but when they're in the home, I mean, you see what Amazon's doing with the, the products they're releasing, and Google the same. It, it, a lot of the writing leans towards there will be a visual output. Yes, I'm uh, curious, where are your listeners when they're listening? What context? Uh, and what's the proportion for each of you? And then how is that influencing your thinking about what role voice will play?
Uh, I'm interested in uh, children's content. And what's, I mean, you're doing two minute increments because you're, you're brushing your teeth. But what's the ideal length for children's content? Because, it, it, and, well, that's actually my question, so. Yeah, I, I don't think anyone really knows yet. Like, I mean, we have other children's shows um, called Story Pirates that's just a podcast. And, um, but I think that the way we approach kids in general is treating them with a lot of respect and like how intelligent they are and, and really kind of a lot of the tropes that are said about them, we just are not as following of like, oh, they only have these small attention spans. We don't really agree with that. We feel like the attention spans are actually quite long, but it just takes an engaging educational uh, piece of content to really pull them in. And so we don't know. We, we're excited to continue to explore. Um, you know, we, we're, we're developing a few games for kids and things like that and figuring out, well, what is that engagement time and using the data that comes back to help inform uh, how we produce. And so it's really like test quickly, fail, look at the data, continue to evolve as the space does. Yes, to piggyback off that question for Wilson, could you take us a little bit through the process of like how you guys came up with the idea for Chompers and kind of the pain points, the nuts and bolts of what that timeline was like? Sure, yeah, I mean, it was a long one. Uh, I, before coming to Gimlet, I ran innovation um, for different Omnicom media companies. Most recently was one called Hearts and Science. So I ran innovation for Procter and Gamble's uh, media. And I was working on Crest Kids, and we just couldn't get kids to brush their teeth. And it was, it, uh, you know, tooth decay is the number one chronic uh, disease with children, in the most preventable. And so we came up with the idea of using content as a way to create an affinity toward the experience, and we wanted to serialize it, because our dream situation was the kid, you know, would hear a question in the morning, and then they'd come home from school and say, you know, I, can I brush my teeth? And they'd look forward to that moment. And we, the original plan was produce it for 28 days, morning and night, and then we would um, hopefully develop a healthy habit. And so I was at the agency side, and, um, and I brought this up to Gimlet. I was like, I think we have this idea. And they're like, we love it. And so um, we ended up uh, doing it in partnership uh, with P&G and with Gimlet, and that was, from the moment of ideation to the time that it went live was 15 months. Um, P&G, they want to make data-informed decisions, and the data around kids' um, audio just wasn't there. And so it was a really big leap of faith that took a ton of work to convince them. And then from a production standpoint, I mean, I, I recommend listening to it. It's, I mean, the team just puts their heart into it. There's original scoring. There's songs written for it. There's quizzes. They interview astronauts. They interviewed Andrew W.K. for Music Week. You know, really funny stuff. And, um, and, and then so after that first uh, uh, season, if you will, of the 28 days, we now have it slated through the end of the year, three weeks on, one week off. And, and the process, you know, the, it's, we have a team, a dedicated team of about six people, and all they do is produce chompers. Um, and so it took a long time to get buy-in from the brand because it was such a new um, uh, experience. But, um, but we, we knew something in our gut that this was going to fill a white space. Yeah. We got time for two more questions. Hi. Um, how do you guys handle the implicit bias that voice has? And how do you uh, kind of choose which voices to use in order to kind of grasp a larger audience? That's a good question.
Um, first, I want to say I'm a huge fan of Gimlet, and I listen to a lot of podcasts, and you guys are the only ones whose ads I listen to. <laughs> um, you do a really good job of like keeping it narrative and interesting. Um, I'm coming as like a personal podcaster that I've had for a couple of years. So I know you said it's hard to discover someone who's not a big brand. So do you have any advice, even though voice technology is so new, for podcasters that do it on their own to kind of be discovered and use voice? One more question. She had a hand up. Uh, uh, I have a particular question. So have you done anything um, particular with caption uh, of the podcast? Uh, have, have, have you say, using caption to help to do a certain things? And actually, a sec second question. Uh, is there any particular steps or technology you use to help, uh, to help you to scale? So I think the, the first question is, could you repeat the question again? Um, have you done anything leveraging captions or transcripts of the audio? And second thing, um, have, is there any particular technologies or um, techniques you have done to help your product to scale? The, the, the asking about the transcripts ones is an interesting one because I think one of the things holding voice back the most is this fear of privacy, right? And um, it's so fascinating that people are like, oh, I'm so scared about having this thing in my home that can listen to me when we all have cell phones within touching us at all times that has the same capability, if not, and, and doing it. You know, it's proven that these microphones. So we, we really stay away from the transcript stuff just because we know that there's there's a lot of concern around um, what is being done with that data. And so we're extremely, especially like, you know, with COPA and making sure that we're totally compliant when it comes to kids. Uh, the data one is, is, uh, is a tricky one when it comes to transcripts, but I do think there's a lot of creativity that's untapped with how you can use it. Um, but we are, we're thinking about how can we use the transcripts of what we produce now, um, not from a, acquisition standpoint of the user, but more to translate to all these different languages across the world, and that's what we're working on right now. And the second question she had was more about, like, are you guys using any specific technology to create skills, or is that something you just don't, you know? Well, I mean, the thing about skills is it's really simple code, which is kind of nice, you know? It's like the publishers have all the heavy lifting, whether it be, you know, Microsoft, Amazon, um, Google, they're doing a lot of the heavy lifting. The code uh, to write a skill is becoming simpler and simpler. We were talking about you know, some of these, these programs to make it even common language, and I think that's the, gonna be the real turning point. I and mean, we saw this with websites when it went from computer scientists uh, developing websites, and all of a sudden WordPress comes out, Tumblr <laughs> comes out, MySpace comes out, and like all of a sudden the artist community attacks this medium. And I think when skills are that simple, we'll see this burst of creativity, and that's when we'll really understand what's possible with this medium. So the technology, I, I bet it's all pretty similar, but with some, with some variation. Yeah, we, we're trying to differentiate ourselves for the most part with our storytelling, with our content, um, and less so on the technology side. So a, a digital skill or action, we're generally using transcripts to make that content available. And this is not an endorsement of this product, but I. I use Storyline, and I made we we basically made our first uh, voice voice skill, which will be released next week. It's the meditation skill, and so it was really pretty simple uh, to to do. And I actually did the basic work for that in about maybe about five hours. Uh, so you know, just you know, they you know, not an endorsement, but it works. It's really simple. There you go. 
for to wrap this up, I definitely would love everyone to know how you know how can they keep in touch with you. You have a, a Twitter, Instagram, anything of that nature that people can hit you up and pitch you podcasts. <laughs> Yeah, and for us, and just following Gimlet Media on Twitter and on Instagram, we post um, a ton of stuff about our, our new shows. And, um, and yeah, uh, likewise, we have a show actually with Squarespace, Squarespace where we take um, pitches of podcasts. It's kind of like American Idol for podcasters. <laughs> there you go. Thank you so much. Let's give them a round of applause. This is great. Thank you.